Okay. Tonight we're going to uh, start uh, a series. I believe I've done this before, um, but it's been a little while. Um, and I, I want to do this series. Um, it's based on work I had done uh, previously on church uh, revitalization, but I think it is applicable not just to the church that is seeking to be revitalized, brought back to life, but I think it, it, it's also applicable to the church who is a, a baby, just starting out, a church that it wants to be a lively uh, church. Uh, and since most of this will be at least rooted in the book of Acts, I've, I've chosen to name the series Acting Like a Church. So that's where we're going to begin tonight. We're going to begin with the topic that I'm calling Dive survive, or thrive. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for uh, your many gifts, and we thank you for the church. And Lord, we pray that through these studies, you would help us to begin to act like the church ought to act, to see where we are doing well, and to see where we are not doing well, and that we would uh, repent and that we would turn toward you in those areas, and that we would truly begin to act like the church that you would have us to be. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to start off with a reading from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verses 31 through 35. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace was upon them. And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a show, I think it's back on TV now, called Let's Make a Deal. Is that, I think that's back on TV. And there would uh, be this portion of the show where they would have like three curtains, and uh, they would have to pick between what curtain they wanted. And oftentimes one curtain had something that was absolutely fa fabulous. Another one might have something that was still pretty good, but, you know, it wasn't the big prize of the day. And then the third one would be like, I forget the word they used, but I know this word's on other game shows, a zonk. It was, it was not the good prize. It wasn't the one that everybody wanted. Church life can often be the same way. We need to pick a lane, pick a door, but we're often not even conscious of what we are picking for the life of our church. Are we picking the best? Are we picking the middle of the road? Or are we living with the consolation prize? The point of what we're going to go through over these next several weeks is to discover where we are as a church. And anybody who would hear this, and it, to discover where we are and where we ought to be as a church. And those three doors, so to speak, I've named as Dive, Survive, and Thrive. Dive, Survive, and Thrive. Got a nice rhyme going. When a church is on the dive, if they're a long-standing church, they are on the decline. Though not necessarily numerically on the decline. Now, I want to set this up right from the front, that when I'm talking about a church that is showing life, I am not necessarily talking about a church that is full. Because there are lots of ways to make your church full. 
And plenty of those have nothing to do with being an actual church or acting like an actual church. We're talking about something different. We're talking about being a church that is going to thrive. A church that is diving has several components missing from church life. The problems in those kinds of churches are often misidentified. They're often placed in the blame where it doesn't belong. And solutions that they try to try to revitalize the church, bring it back to life, or in, in the case of a small fledgling church, to bring it to life, well, they're not the right ones because they don't address the real problems. So if we want to be a church that has life, we want to make sure we're addressing the real issues of church life. A church that is on the dive, if it does not correct its course, will crash. The church will either die numerically, which sometimes happens, or the church will die theologically and practically. A church can have a lot of people and be completely dead. Look around any town and you'll see. The church in Sardis was warned about this very condition. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation but being, for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. How can a church have a reputation for being alive but actually be dead? This happens when the wrong measures of health and life are used. Picture this scenario. A, a nurse walks into a hospital room to check on a patient. She looks around the room. She sees the blanket uh, is covering up the patient. They look very comfortable. Their eyes are closed. There's lots of family in the room. The IV is hooked up correctly. Everything looks good. And the nurse concludes that the patient is alive and well. But in fact, the patient is dead. She has failed to notice that the patient was cold even though he was covered. The IV may still have been running, but the heart rate monitor was flat. He had no pulse, was not breathing, and the family that was gathered around the bed were wailing. A simple look at the right thing would have told her all that she needed to know. And this is how churches are often evaluated. How churches evaluate themselves sometimes. The wrong measures are used. The church in Corinth is a prime example of a diving church. The church in Corinth had divisions. They used worldly wisdom. They were sexually immoral. There were lawsuits among believers. They were idolaters, there were worship issues, there were doctrinal issues. Every one of these things was a sign that the church was on the dive, yet they couldn't see it for themselves. Paul had to point it out to them. Sometimes churches on the dive don't even realize it themselves. Other times they do. In each case, the church needs someone to point out the real reasons why. They also need someone to point to the right solutions. So as we go through this study, we're not just going to be looking at whether we're doing things right or whether we're doing things wrong, whether we're heading toward life or heading toward death. We're going to look at the proper solutions for such things as well. And some of those things that we go through, you might discover are very common sense, but if we're not conscious of them, we won't be doing them. The second type of church I told you is the surviving church. Unfortunately, I think churches kind of like ours, small church, church plants, can get stuck in a survival mode rather than 
desiring to thrive. But it happens in long-standing churches, too. They can be called things like the ingrown church or a faithful remnant mentality. The church is not declining, at least numerically, but they're certainly not healthy. They're simply maintaining things. They may even feel like they're doing well since they're not on the dive like some other churches. They look at those churches and they say, Look at them, their attendance is down. Look at them, their doctrine is bad. Look at them, the people over there can't get along. They may not realize, but they're just barely getting by. People who've been sick or injured for a significant amount of time may not remember what it's like to be healthy. There were those who decline in health have been so slow and so gradual that they don't even notice that they're not healthy anymore. And churches can be that way too. A church may be unhealthy for so long that it doesn't even remember what it looks like to be a truly healthy church. Likewise, a church's fade from thriving to just surviving may be so slow and gradual that they don't even notice. Likewise, a church might not even notice that they're just trying to survive rather than just trying rather than trying to thrive. Hopefully, again, as we go through this study, we will see those kinds of things and desire to be a church that will thrive. Revelation chapter 2, the church in Ephesus is kind of the picture of a surviving church. Revelation 2, 1 through 5, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. I know how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found themselves to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Sounds pretty good so far. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now Paul starts off, or not Paul, sorry, John starts off with these words of praise for the believing community in Ephesus. They're surviving church. They seem like they're doing many things right biblically. Yet, the church failed in one important area. They had lost their zeal for God. They're described as having abandoned their first love. They kind of wandered away from it. Apparently not so far so that it would be a concern, but far enough to point it out. This is the perfect example of how a church can just survive instead of thrive. They may lack true love and compassion toward one another, as well as toward the lost. The church can become f obsessed with numbers, and finance, neither of which are measures of church health. And that's important for us here to remember as we are still small and growing. While it may reflect a deeper spiritual issue, there is also the tendency of those churches to react in unbiblical ways to improve those situations. So whether you are a long-standing church in survival mode or you are a young church seeking to thrive, we need to make sure that we are using biblical measures to being a thriving church. Thriving should be the goal of any church. Whether they are a long-standing church or whether they are a brand new one. A thriving church is one that is strong, abounding in love, biblically wise, evangelistic, 
making disciples, caring for their members and their needs. People in the church love and trust one another. Paul gives some examples of this in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, we read, We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not in word, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. Yet you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. That you have become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of God sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning among us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God. That sounds like the kind of church I want to be involved in. A church that is characterized by faith and love and steadfastness. A church that clings to the word of God and does not stand for idolatry. Paul's not done talking about them and praising them. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 8 through 13, he says, For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly day and night that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct you, direct our way to you, that the Lord may make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with the saints. I don't think Paul's trying to say that they're not abounding in love. He wants them to abound in love more and more. He recognizes they are a church that stands fast in the truth. <laughs> One other place. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers through Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. The Thessalonian church is commended for many signs of thriving. They're sound in doctrine and in practice. They exhibit great love for one another. They have left idolatry behind and are pursuing Christ and his kingdom. While they are thriving, Paul encourages them to press on in their obedience to God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 and 2. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord that as you have received from us, how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. You know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. More and more. More and more. It's a praise and a challenge at the same time. Paul is saying, you guys are doing so well in everything that you are doing. Do it more. This is not a dissatisfaction on Paul's part. This is a, a desire of, for that church to, to grow and to flourish. Thriving churches keep pursuing vitality more and more. And that ought to be our goal. To always consider 
Always, always desire. Not just to survive, but to thrive, to be vital, to be alive, to never be settled with just being okay. But thriving, not even just for our sake, but for the sake of the glory of God. Now, a church, let's be honest, that desires to thrive like this may not be the most popular church in town. Let's be honest. If we really do all the things that we that we need to do to, to thrive, there are going to be people who don't like that. Because we're not using all of the bells and whistles that people think that they need to have in order to grow a church. But if we are small, but full of life, I'd rather have small and full of life. The right kind of life. Obviously, we don't want to remain small. But I also believe if we desire to be a thriving body. People will be attracted to that. Maybe believers who are in churches that are dead and dying or surviving. But more importantly, I think a thriving church will attract the lost. Because it will be doing everything that a church is supposed to be doing. And it will be attractive. Because from within its midst, the light of the gospel shines bright. So the purpose of our study is to demonstrate what things are markers of church vitality. And the things that a church can do to bring back lost liveliness. Or begin with liveliness. The spiritualized open at church must look into the mirror of scriptures and take an honest inventory. A church must set aside its preconceived notions of what it thinks are true signs of life and pursue those things which the scripture commends. The book of Acts, in part, is going to provide a mirror that the church will need, that we will need, to determine whether we are diving, surviving, or thriving. Now, as we'll see, the church of the church in the book of Acts and the book of Acts is not the most perfect model because it is the church in transition, the church, the New Testament church in birth. But there are plenty of principles for us to see what it means for us to be a church that is acting like a church. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to, as a church, to, to thrive, to be full of life and vitality, whether seedling of a church or a mighty oak, whether just a few or hundreds Lord, we desire that all churches would thrive with the gospel. Lord, help us hear and help those who may hear to desire to thrive to your honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen.